uh, six different people throughout the fall about how they're living for Christ as best they can in the context of their work environment. And so today, let's give a warm welcome to Joelle Briggs to come on up. Lads, will you clapping? Yes. And uh, Joelle's going to share a little bit. Uh, here you go. Here's your mic. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, Joelle, you guys have been here for a couple years with the church. Yeah. And Red Coast, sorry. Yes. And I believe your family came to our outdoor movie night. Yes. And that's where we met and got connected. So that was awesome. Uh, really cool. About two years ago. So. Yeah. I think. So. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, okay, so let's start off. Just tell us what you do. Give us a little summary of what a... My kids were laughing about that this morning. Right? Oh, okay, so, what exactly mom does. Okay. Yeah. So I work for the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, I've been there 35 years, so I've held a lot of jobs. Okay. Um, so currently I work for our headquarters office. I work from home, um, and I do what's called airport compliance. So airports that get federal money... SeaTac Airport, you know, Hainfield, all of those, they get federal money, and they have to follow certain laws. It's kind of like, we'll give you money, but you have to do these things. So if they're not following things, or if people think they're not following things, then they contact our office, and we okay. get to work it out. So next time I'm at the airport and I have a problem, I should call you? Yeah. Is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. No. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Um, so tell us just a, a regular day. Just give us a, a picture of, of a typical day for you. Uh, well, since I work for our D.C. office, they are up three hours ahead of us. So I generally start work at about five in the morning. Luckily now, I just work at home. So <laughs> I only have to be dressed up from here and I got from sweats here. on the bottle, right? And I head upstairs and start. Um, I have a list of like decisions, legal decisions, things that I need to be writing um, a lot of writing. Um, however, during that day, there's usually calls and meetings from somebody, you know, a congressman's office or our administrator, someone that's saying, someone's gotten a hold of us and something's wrong. And so what ideas do you have and how to fix that? Yeah. And <laughs> then I get to talk to people and write more okay. and hope to fix it. So a lot of writing and meetings is kind a of a lot of writing and meetings. A lot of your yes. day. Okay. All right. So we've been following the format throughout this with people, uh, trumpets, ashes, and tears. That's been the format. And the trumpets part is what are the just great things you're seeing at your work? What are the ways that God's wired you that you get to use your passions at your work? Um, where do you see God there? So share a little bit about that. What are, what are the trumpets part? So uh, for me, the trumpets really – are not the actual day-to-day -day work, right? The writing, I enjoy writing, and that's a skill I have, but the trumpets are, you know, serving the people around me, serving the coworkers, serving the people, even the people that have issues, right? Or issues with our airports. Mm. <laughs> but um, how do I, God has put me there to kind of serve in various capacities for people. And so even though I'm having meetings with people, and my kids will always say this, you start a meeting and you're not talking about work. Why aren't you talking about work? <laughs> like, well, I kind of start out, and so I'm the one in the office that knows, you know, how so and so is doing in the hurricane, or how's, you know, whose spouse has cancer. So just kind of serving and being there, being an ear. Uh, years ago, I had a boss named Dennis, and I was in the middle of. I worked for HR, and I was running a, a layoff. I did not want to. I was the only one ever run in the agency. And he said, you know, sometimes, and he was very devout. And he said, sometimes it's not the work we do, but how we serve God in that work. And I was able, through that, to um, serve the people, actually, that were getting laid off and helped. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of carried that serving, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's how I do it. Yeah. And I've seen that. We've talked about that. Just such a huge servant's heart in kind of practical ways. And people at your work who are walking through stuff, maybe not the actual work part, but just outside of that, you have a great opportunity, it sounds like. And you've used that to just to share with them, love them, have compassion on them, walk with them through it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. what I enjoy. Okay. All right. Um, how about the ashes? <laughs> the ashes part is what parts of your job maybe have brought out some of the things in your life that are not 
great that God's kind of exposed. What are some of the struggles with that? What are some Ashley's part? So before I had the job that I have now, I was a manager of the Seattle district office. And so we oversaw airports in Washington and Oregon. Um, and there's a lot of power in that job. You're handing out a lot of money and people kind of have to do what you say. So it's really kind of nice it, as, as far as having. <laughs> so, and I was also serving the people in my group. I had 23 people and I knew every single one of their issues. You know, I had someone who was suicidal. I had someone whose wife or husband suddenly died. I had, so I was doing all of that, but I was taking it all and I wasn't really showing where God was, right? It was, I can fix it. I can fix anything. You know, there's a problem here. I can fix it. And um, I loved the job and the serving, but I was also getting worn out a little bit. And then, you know, I thought I'd be in that job forever. God had a turn for me or somebody had a turn for me. And um, I was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. Um, and suddenly everything stopped and here was something I couldn't fix. Mm -hmm. And God kind of let me sit in that space for a while, mm -hmm. but at the same time sent an amazing amount of people who were praying for me and showing me where Jesus was and walking me through that. And I was able to realize, you know, I might be strong. I'm not strong without God, mm. right? And mm. and so I just kind of exempl I not exemplified that, but as I walked through that, um, my employees saw it, mm. and uh, toward the end, some of them came to me individually and said, you know, I've watched this, I've watched what happened, and I've returned to church. I've done this, or, you know, I'm finding... Jesus from what you've you've done um so I wasn't happy about it it was not a fun trip <laughs> I would not recommend <laughs> waiting for that kind of thing yeah. but um so then as a result um I I was not the same person at the end of the cancer treatment that I was before mm -hmm. and I didn't have the capacity mental capacity to stay up with that job ended up in the current job. So a lot of grieving for leaving the job I loved, um, but seeing where God is leading me, he has put me in a better job, given a, actually a better manager for to make it through COVID for the team that I had. So. Mm. It's amazing in all that. I mean, there's struggles there, there's messiness, there's having your control exposed. And yet in all of it, God did just awesome stuff. It's so cool he to did. hear what a great story of God work in your life with that. So that's, that's beautiful. Um, how about the last part is tears. Tears are, are not so much maybe things God is you, but just challenges. What are just wrestling things you wrestle with that you'd love prayer for as you work in this job? Um, really seeing where, where do I serve God in this, in this world, right? In this, in this job, it's a remote job. I don't see people face to face. Mm. Where does he want me to serve every day. I think some of that is also, you know, I'm not sure, but having me at home, I'm able to be with my family more. Um, in the old job, you know, I was serving everybody else and maybe leaving my family for last. Um, so, you know, is that where it is? But mm. that, and, you know, there's still a little bit of grief of not being around the people I was before. Mm -hmm. And not being used for not being even in the role before, too. You said that's still hard. Kind of wondering a, about um, sort of maybe value. Like, am I really valuable to this place because I'm not in that role before? Is that Right. I can, I mean, in the other role, I could get stuff done really fast. <laughs> now I see where the bureaucracy is and yeah. I can't move as fast. Um, and so also, you know, am I doing the right thing? I always kind of think, you know, I can write, but I don't write that well. And, you know, I... I'm, I'm kind of waiting for someone to discover I don't know how to do the job I have. <laughs> I think that's probably all of us, but. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, so. okay. Um, wow, that's so awesome. Thank you so much, Joelle. Thank you for sharing your heart, um, just how God has been using you. It's certainly a journey you would have never expected, um, you would ever pick, 
but yet God's done really awesome things in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, join me in prayer as we pray for Joel. Jesus, uh, we just thank you so much. Wow, what an amazing story, Lord. Uh, just a story of uh, Joel stepping in and being obedient, God, to serve you in that role. And Lord, in a role with, with a lot of authority um, over people and ability to do great things, God, and yet in that you changed it, God, and with her diagnosis of cancer and what that meant for her life and her family and her work and the changes that came with that, Lord. And on one hand, it's, I know, probably deeply grieving and um, sad to leave all that, Lord, and just look what it once was, and maybe to a degree who she once was, Lord. But I just think of what you've uh, uh, replaced it with, uh, Lord, just more of you, a, a greater reliance upon you, Lord, uh, a greater depth of relationship uh, and closeness to you, God. And so we just thank you for that. And I just pray for Joel, uh, for her role, God. I pray wherever you've got her right now, even if it's not maybe the ideal spot, you would continue to bless her, Lord. Help her to impact the employees she's around. And God, give her some people she can serve. Just maybe put some practical needs in front of her that she can meet. Um, she's so good at that and so skilled. And so just pray for those opportunities, Lord. Thank you so much for Joelle. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's give her another huge thank you for sharing. You're welcome to stand as we continue to sing this morning.
Lord God, there is nothing better than you. Thank you, Father. We're going to dismiss uh, the kids right now. You're dismissed. Uh, join me as we pray over them. Lord God, thank you for the kids at Arbor Heights. God, thank you for each uh, little child here, God. They are a blessing. I thank you for the joy they bring us. I thank you they help us not to take ourselves so seriously and to be able to laugh and just experience the fun and the joy and the grace of you, God. We pray hand over there this morning, God. We pray their hearts would learn. And we thank you for those volunteers giving up a Sunday morning to serve down there. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's continue worshiping. so that we may be forgiven and have eternal life with you. Amen.
God, you don't need our worship. Our worship doesn't make you more. It doesn't make you less, Lord God. We're the ones that need to worship. We're the ones that need to worship you, Lord. Our, our hearts are so attracted and garnered to all kinds of things in this world, God. And, and you tell us to lift up uh, our hearts off those things and lift you up. You are the king. You are the greatest king. You're the king of all kings. I pray, Lord God, this morning that you could, by your Holy Spirit, just awaken our hearts. Take off the things in our eyes and our hearts that cannot see you, that do not make you great, Lord, so we can see the great king. We can see the Lord of all lords. We can see the Lord who has risen, the Lord who is, when he returns, that every knee will bow, every tongue confess the name of Christ. God, we pray today that we can get a glimpse of your glory, and it would inspire us, and it would crush us. And we would kneel before you and praise you as king of kings. Thank you, God. I pray over your word that you'll speak to us this morning, God. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Use the words I've prepared this week, God. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, well, good morning. A um, couple things I want to mention before jump in here. First off is um, last week, if you weren't with us, I shared with us a new communication platform that we're starting at our church uh, called Listen and Learn. And there's a handout in your bulletin. If uh, you can look, you can look later at it. Don't even look right now, but it's in your bulletin. And what it is, is this, is that every quarter, um, three members from our leadership board and elder team are going to gather. And we want to hear from you as a church. If there is a concern you have, on one hand, about something in the church or just a general concern, we want to hear that from you. Or if it's a ministry opportunity. If there's something you think the church should be involved in, you think there's a really cool opportunity for us in the community, we want to hear that. And so each quarter we're going to do that. Our next one's coming up on November 6th at 7 p.m. And so I want to invite you to join us if you'd like to do that. Let our office know, and uh, we'll have you be a part of that. So again, listen and learn. It's something we're starting up. Hopefully to go each quarter and in your bulletin, more detail on this handout. Okay. Um, also want to mention, too, as we're jumping into our Malachi series, that we created a Bible study for you uh, here, and you can find them out on the Connect desk. There's no charge. They're free. We created them for you, and it basically follows the sermons, and each week it's got a summary of the text and then questions for you. So this can be an individual study. It can be a group study, and during the week you can follow along with our messages. So check it out. There's a stack of them on the Connect desk out there. Okay. All right, let's jump in. We are in our second week here in Malachi. We just launched a series uh, last week called uh, Return to Me. God is saying to the Israelites, return to me. And if you were not with us last week, we started off, we talked about God's relentless, incredible love. If you're here with us, God loves us. God has chosen us. God's put his affections on us, and he loves us radically and relentlessly, and we learned about that last week. Today we're going to jump into the next section in Malachi. And if you remember last week what I said, it's in a question and answer format, right? There's six chunks in Malachi, and every time God says a statement to the Israelites, and then they basically say, give us evidence. Give us proof. You made this claim, God. Prove to us that that's actually true. And that's each section in here, okay? And so um, let's read. If you have a Bible, you can open up. It should be on the screen behind us as well, I think. Uh, Malachi 6, 1, uh, excuse me, Ma Malachi 1, 6 through 14. There we go. Malachi chapter 1, 6 through 14. Here we go. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where's the honor due me? If I'm a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. And here goes our question and answer. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? You can tell us this is a very kind, gentle text. 
Now implore God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it. By saying of the Lord's table, it is defiled, and of its food, it is contemptible. And you say, what a burden! And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemish animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. So in your house, you might have something that has a warning label on it. You're familiar with those? This sermon comes with a warning label. Um, this is going to be a tough sermon to hear today. Uh, this is <laughs> there are some sermons that you come to, and it's a pat on the back, and that's awesome. Last week was kind of a pat on the back sermon. There's some sermons that are a punch in the gut, and that's going to be today. Uh, that's one of those messages, and, and I just want to say a couple things about that, because it's going to be a hard, weird, hard word to hear today from God and to all of us, um, right? But never take one sermon out of a sermon series. That's one thing. Never do that. Always put sermons in the context of a whole entire series, because there might be one message, I do one thing, and a different message, I do something else, but it's all together in one. So don't pull out one. That's dangerous. Here's the second thing. This is why at Arbor Heights Community Church, we faithfully and consistently preach God's word. Because what's God's word, when you're in God's word, what it does, and if you, right, you're reading in the week, some messages are encouraging, they're comforting, they're compassionate. Other messages you read and you read and you go, ouch, that hurts, God. That hurts. That was not easy to hear that. But that's why we preach God's word, because we don't want to be like the people in 2 Timothy that Paul says of them, who don't put up with sound doctrine, but instead to suit their own desires, gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. We don't want that, and we won't do that. We will preach God's word. Sometimes it offends us. Sometimes it doesn't. Today might be one of those ones it offends us. Okay, so let's just jump in. Uh, March 16th, 1977. President Jimmy Carter... Uh, was on his people-to-people -people campaign. Anybody remember that? I guess if you raise your hand, you're kind of dating yourself. So, uh, But he was on his people-to-people -people campaign. Jimmy Carter was traveling around the country, and the campaign was, I want to connect with people, just everyday average American people, get into their homes and meet them on the ground level. And so Jimmy Carter in 1977 on March 16th did a town hall meeting in Clinton, Massachusetts, and he gave a town hall packed meeting. And then after the town hall meeting, he went to the, or the house of Kay Thompson and her husband and their eight children, and he stayed the night. Jimmy Carter, president of the United States, stayed the night in this family's home. When he came up on the doorstep, they opened the door, and he gave her a hug and a kiss on the cheek and said he was so glad to be there. Uh, forgive the language, but her son said this, quote, she was glad her family was chosen to represent the country, but she was nervous as hell, is what he said. Amen. Yeah, I would be too, wouldn't you? And she said later when she wrote about this experience, actually there's a picture we have, I think, right there. There it is. That's uh, Kay Thompson and Jimmy Carter in her home. She's given him a little tour of the house. And uh, when they were uh, in there, she said she was a nervous wreck. It, yeah, exactly, right? Cleaning, getting it ready, telling the kids, knock it off, be on your best behavior, right? Eight kids? That was chaos in that home. She was a nervous wreck. This is interesting, too. Her husband and her uh, gave Jimmy Carter their uh, bedroom, and so he slept in their bedroom in there, and she says he remembered they had to install a special red phone on the nightstand so that he could be available to the White House. They had to put there. 
it was funny too, uh, Jimmy Carr the next morning, showers in your house, gets up to come have breakfast with you, have some cereal, right? And then the daughter, one of the daughters, Jane, was going to be late for school. So Jimmy Carter said, let me just write a note for you for your school. So he wrote a note that said, quote, please excuse Jane for being late. She had a guest in her home. Thank you, Jimmy. She had a guest in her home. Now, I highly doubt, and maybe I don't know, I highly doubt this could ever happen today. I highly doubt that the president's going to come to one of our homes and stay and sit around in our house. But here's my question. What if it did? What if you got a phone call this afternoon that said the president's coming tomorrow night? Don't get, don't get political here. Just the president's coming to your home. Would you not be a little nervous? Would you not be thinking, oh, my gosh, I got to go home and get things ready? Here's my question. When the president came to your house, and say he did come to your house, when the president came to your house, would you answer the door in your old T-shirt and your gym shorts? No, of course you wouldn't. And if you did, that would be really stupid. You wouldn't do that, right? Um, when he came, would you serve him leftover mac and cheese from two nights ago? Hey, you know what? Let me just throw it in the microwave real, real quick. I'll whip up some PB&Js. We'll have a great meal. Uh, hey, over on the couch, if you just scoot, scoot the laundry over. No big deal. The dirty clothes are there. Just scoot it over. You would never do that, would you? Your house would be spick and span. You'd be wearing your best clothes probably. You'd make the best meal in the world possible, right? You would give your very best. But why is it when it comes to God, that's sometimes the exact opposite, Here's the question I want to ask you, and I want you to think about this the whole entire week. Are you giving God your leftovers? Are you giving God your leftovers? As you look at your life and do an honest self-assessment, is God getting the scraps? The scraps of your time, the scraps of your finances, the scraps of your effort, the scraps of your priorities. Is God getting the leftovers? That's what I want to ask you, and I want you to be thinking about this whole message and this whole week. Is he getting the leftovers? You know, have you ever felt that you weren't prioritized in someone's life, but you prioritized them? You ever felt that way? Maybe a friend, maybe a spouse, maybe a colleague. You carved out time for them, but they didn't carve out time for you. You were willing to put effort in the relationship, but they just gave barely any effort at all. You were willing to sacrifice, but they weren't willing to sacrifice. We've all been there, haven't we? Right? How did you feel? When that happened to you, I think we all know how you felt. We felt hurtful, disrespected, dishonored, probably worthless, probably not valued very much. That's exactly how God feels to the Israelites with this. That's exactly how God feels. Think of God. God is sitting there saying, I've helped you. I've led you. I've fed you. I've taught you. I've put up with all your complaining and your grumbling and your sassy attitudes. I've forgiven you, I've loved you, I've had compassion on you, I rescued you out of slavery, I gave you a land that you didn't build, and I even accommodated myself to you when I knew it would be bad for you. You asked for a king, remember that in the Old Testament? You asked for a king, horrible decision, but guess what? I gave it to you because you wanted it. And what's your response to me? Eh, if I can fit it in my schedule and I have time, yeah, sure, I'll give you that, God. Here, what's exactly the issue? And I want to talk about it for a minute. Why is God so upset with them? And why do they dishonor him and disrespect him so much? Well, it says right here, let's just read it. A son honors his father and mother, uh, a servant his master. I'm a teacher where, or I'm a, a father, where's the honor due me? And they say, how have we shown you that? And he says, you bring defiled animals and place them on the altar. So here's what's going on. Is the Levitical law in the Old Testament required that they bring a perfect animal when they would bring a sacrifice. Now, we don't do that today, of course. That's an Old Testament practice, and it was fulfilled in Jesus. But what was going on is they were to bring a perfect sacrifice. They're and asking, why a perfect sacrifice? Well, for two reasons. Number one is that the very fact a perfect animal was worth a lot more than an injured animal, right? So it was worth a lot more in the market. You could sell it. So God, in other words, I want your best. Don't come and give me second stuff. Give me your best. The second reason is, is because the sacrificial system was all put in place to lead to what? Or I should say to lead to who? Jesus Christ. So, which was a 
perfect sacrifice for our sins. So it's even worse. It's the fact that I've given you a template to follow to point to, the, to my son being given, and you're messing it up. You keep making it look less and ultimately make my son look less. God says you wouldn't even do this to your governor. A, a local, oftentimes non-Jewish official that is temporary, that's only in place for maybe 20 years, then another governor comes in, there uh, another governor comes in, you would never do this. You would be so embarrassed, so humiliated to bring an injured, diseased, blemished animal for them, but then you do it to me, the king, the great king of the world, and you would treat me like that. It'd be almost be like this. Imagine you have your best friend's birthday party. Best friend, you've been friends for 20 plus years, deeply close. You go to their house, big birthday party, you show up at the front door and you realize, oh my gosh, I never prioritized getting a gift for them. This is your best friend for 20 years and you totally didn't get them a gift. And then you panic, they're about to answer the door, you look down, there's a flower pot below you, you see some flowers, you rip them out of the flower pot, they open the door and you go, happy birthday. What are they gonna say to you? They're gonna say, these look awfully familiar. Like right out of the flower pot, right? They're going to think, what, how could you do that? We've been friends for 20 years, and you didn't even get me anything. You totally forgot to get me a gift. God says, you treat me like that. There's the second thing that they're doing, uh, too. The second thing is they're saying that they're going to give God the best, but then they don't, right? You caught that at the end of the, of the reading. Verse 14, cursed is the cheat, uh, strong language, who has an acceptable male in their flock and vows to give it, I'm gonna give it, God, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. God, I'm gonna give you my best. Absolutely, you have all of me, God, every part of my life you have for me. And then it comes down to a difficult decision and I give God the leftovers. And God says, you're a cheat for not giving me what you owe me and the best. I, I, whenever I think of this example, I think of back in 1 Samuel, yeah, the story where Saul gets um, chosen as the king. And he's king, and Saul's a good king for like a couple days. And then it goes downhill. And so Saul starts making all these mistakes and all this different stuff. And at one point, God comes to Saul, and he says, listen, Saul. He says, I want you to go, and there's this group of people, and it's God's judgment on them for all these kinds of wicked things they've done. And God says, I want you to go, and I want you to, and I want you to actually wipe them out. And Saul says, okay, I got it. And this is God's justice again. This is not Saul choosing this. This is God's justice on these people. And so Saul goes and Saul does this. And then Samuel the prophet says, I'll meet you at the, at the battlefield. And Samuel goes and he meets him at the battlefield. And when he gets out to the battlefield and the war's over, Samuel says this interesting phrase, why do I hear sheep beating or bleeding? Why do I hear that? Because I remember God said that everything should be, should be dealt with. And then Saul begins to make all these excuses. Well, the sheep, there's something, this. And then he had all these soldiers he left to. Well, there's all these soldiers, and I was going to keep them, and then we're going to help them do this. And Samuel looks at them, and Samuel says, I can't believe you, had, you uh, did this. And this is what he says, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Saul did a bunch of sacrifices, and so in his mind, he says, I did it, I did it. And Samuel says, Saul, what matters is not you did a bunch of religious stuff. What matters is you obey God, is you do what he told you to do. And we just need to pause and say, you know, I think some of us are involved in things today, right now, maybe things people don't know about, but we know about, some of us are involved with things today, thinking things today, aware of things today that need to stop, and we're not stopping. Some of us are involved in something, and we need to start doing something, and we're not. And I want you to hear this today. No amount of church attendance, generous giving, or moral living can ever cancel out a disobedient life. Please hear that. No amount of religious, moral, church attendance will ever cancel out in your life right now if you are disobeying God. Even in the smallest part of your life, 
if you are not following him and you know you ought to be, it doesn't matter anything you're doing on the outside. None of it matters. God sees it. And a good reminder that partial disobedience in God's eyes is full disobedience. There is no half obedience or not. It's either obedience or disobedience. There's nothing in the middle. God has strong, strong words to say. God says in verse 10, basically this, because you guys are giving your leftovers to me, because I'm the king and you bring me blemished animals, honestly, I'd rather have you shut the temple. I'd rather have you shut the whole temple down, turn out the lights, close it, don't even come. And to translate that to our modern context, I don't want to be too harsh or hard, but what God's essentially kind of saying is, if you're going to live a life with me and I'm going to get the leftovers in your life, in most of your life, don't even bother coming here on a Sunday morning. If you're not going to take me seriously, if you're not going to actually want to follow me and do what I ask you to do, it doesn't even make sense to come. I told you this is going to be a hard, a hard message. But that's what he's saying. That's what God's coming to them and saying, don't bring the leftovers. Here's another kind of point I want to pull out from this. Religious activity, however good, moral, spiritual looking, done half-heartedly is displeasing to God. He says it right there. You come and you do these things and you lay these animals on my altar. I am not pleased with you. Religious activity, however good, moral, and spiritual looking it is, if done half-heartedly, is not pleasing to God. Even if the people around you think it looks spiritual, or they affirm you, or they like you, or they applaud you in that, if in our hearts God seeing it as half-hearted, it's dishonoring, disrespectful, and defaming of him. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, Mark chapter uh, 12 in the Gospels. We've been going through Mark, and we did Mark a little bit earlier. And I'll read to you Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. It says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Jesus has this amazing moment. I, I love this scene because he sits down with the disciples, and they basically translate it to modern day, like Jesus is looking at your transaction on your uh, giving, and he's seeing everything. It's not just what people see, it's what God sees actually going on behind the scenes. And Jesus says, let's just watch. Let's just see what everybody does. And so they watch, and just a note too, in the Old Testament, where they would give, there were these uh, large like metal cans. So they would put in physical money. So when you put in like two pennies, it was a ding, ding. When you put in a massive amount of money, it was ding, 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 ding. You know, and everyone knew, wow, that's a lot of money. You're a big giver right? Wow, what a spiritual person. And they're looking at that, and the disciples, I bet you a million dollars were thinking, wow, Jesus, look at how much money they're putting in. Those guys are so religious. And then some lady goes over, and it goes, ding, ding. And they're probably look over and think, well, that was embarrassing. And then Jesus says, come on in close, guys. Listen. He says, see those guys giving everything? And they say, yeah, they're so amazing, Jesus. And Jesus says, actually, if you knew what they made, and you found out how much they're giving, it's about 1% of their actual income. It's not sacrificial at all. It's basically surplus on their money, and so it's not even a sacrifice in their lives. This other woman, oh yeah, the one, that was embarrassing when she put that small amount of money in. Jesus said, actually, do you know she couldn't pay rent for this month, and that was all of her rent money? And she gave it all. And he looks at which one do you think God's more pleased with? I guess it's the woman, right? I guess it's the woman, it's her, because it was all about her heart. What's the first and greatest commandment in the whole Bible? I mean, what did Jesus sum the entire thing up into? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, 
all your mind and all your strength. All, 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 right? Jesus said it's all about your heart. It doesn't matter a bunch of religious activity. I want you. I want your soul. Here's the second thing I notice in this text to dry out. Do my actions betray my faith? Do my actions betray my faith? Because this guy at the end was saying, God, I'm going to give you the best. I promise. God, whenever it gets hard, I'm always going to choose you. And then it gets hard, and guess what? He doesn't. He gives the leftovers. And so that's a case, I think, of where I say something, but my life doesn't back it up. I say God's first, but my life doesn't back it up. You see this in James chapter 2, right? If you're familiar with this passage, James chapter 2, where James talks about our actions backed up, or our words backed up by our actions. Let me read uh, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if a person claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go, I wish you will keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Did you hear that? A faith that is not matched by a lifestyle of following God. James says is dead. It's not even halfway there. It's dead before God. And so we sing as a church, God is our provider, but would my monthly giving statement back that up? I proclaim Jesus is Lord, but would my calendar show that? We cry out, God is holy, but what a quick review of your Netflix and Hulu, Hulu viewing over the last month reveal that. It doesn't matter saying things. It matters to back them up in my life, and that's what Malachi is getting at. And what he really is saying is a leftover life indicates a leftover heart. A leftover life is an indication of a leftover heart. You want to hear something pretty scary about this passage? And you're probably thinking, you've already said a lot of things that are somewhat scary. There's something even more scary about this passage. It's that they actually never, do you notice they never stop giving sacrifices? Notice they didn't actually, it wasn't like they stopped and were like, we want nothing to do with you, God, because that's so bad. Everybody would know that. That's an observable rejection of God. So what they did is, they gave their sacrifice and continued to do it. They just gave it with half their heart. They just kept doing it, but it was with half their heart. My hunch is, and I could be wrong, my hunch is that there are churches across America full of people like this. Where on one hand, I can't totally reject God because that would be really bad, and everybody would know that, and it would be, be an observable, explicit rejection of him. But I also don't want to sell out to Jesus. Like, I don't want all of him, and he doesn't want all of me. So I'll just pick the middle. There are so many people who pick the middle. And we artificially, and I say that word very on purpose, we artificially pick the spot where I can choose the times where I'm in with Jesus and I can avoid the times being out with Jesus. When it's convenient, I'm in. When it's inconvenient, I'm out. And we pick this middle spot. We stay in a lukewarm position. But here's some really tough thing to hear. If you'll recall some sobering words Jesus said to people, who wanted to stay in a lukewarm spot. Revelation 3, 15 through 16, I know your deeds, he says to this church. I know your deeds. I know your hearts. People see the outside. I know what's inside of you, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. It's okay as a church to say ouch, because that's an ouch verse. That phrase really stuck out to me. I wish you were either one or the other. I wonder if Jesus came this morning and sat in front of you right now, if that'd be his question for you. I wish you were one or the other. If you don't want me, then, then don't bother. Stop fooling around. Stop playing games with me. Stop having one foot in and one foot out. Just, just go. But if you're in, then be in. Be all in. Don't mess around. Quit playing games. Don't give me half of you. Give me all of you. 
See, this is what I think with Jesus. You either jump in the deep end of the pool or you don't get in the pool. You either jump in the deep in the pool or don't even get in the pool. That's hard to hear, isn't it? That's a tough word. It's a tough word for me. That's hard for all of us. What I've noticed in my own heart is the natural default for me is to love the middle road. To love the middle road. But what I've noticed in scripture over and over the theme is Jesus never allows people to stay in the middle. You notice that? Never ever does Jesus allow that. The rich young ruler who came to him, where did he invite the guy to? To leave everything. Leave everything and come and follow me. Jesus said to his disciples, what? Leave your father, mother, everything. Leave your application. Come and follow me. Jesus said to the crowds, if you don't give up, what's the word? Everything. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot follow me. Jesus, after giving a really tough sermon, all these people walked away, and he looked at the disciples and said, do you want to leave too? You see, I think we love to create this middle place because it's easy and we can still look religious and do it, and people think it's okay. Jesus doesn't think it's okay. And we're just playing games, to be honest, rather than surrendering our lives totally. It reminds me a little bit of that friend. Have you ever had that friend who's always switching plans around? Anybody have that friend? And if it's not that friend, it could be you. Um, it's, that, it's that friend, right? Do you ever have that friend that it's like you can never pin them down with a plan? What are we doing on Friday night? Well, let me just check. I'll text you later once I hear from so-and-so. Or I'm not sure about this. I have this phone call, and I'll see. And then you hear about Friday night, and they actually are doing something different, right? And, and, and you always realize what's going on there. The truth is they're keeping their options open. Aren't they? We, we know that. And it's kind of the same thing with us and Jesus. It's like, if I stay in the middle, I keep my options open. If he calls me here, that sounds good. I can go there. If he calls me here, though, eh, I'm going to kind of go back to over here. And so we keep the options open. Another very convicting statement, it's just keep coming this morning. It's, it's going to keep coming, is when the, uh, the parable of the talents, you're familiar with this from the Bible? The parable of the talents, right, where uh, the master gives each of his servants an amount of money, 10 uh, coins, 5 coins, and 1 coin. And the one with 10 doubles it. The one with 5 doubles it. The one with 1, he buries it in the ground because he's scared that something's going to happen. So he just buries it and does nothing with it. He plays it safe. And the master comes back. The master applauds the one with 10, applauds the one with 5. And the one with 1, I couldn't believe the word he used. The master called him wicked. Wicked? He didn't do anything wrong. It's not like he went out and like spent it on really horrible, gross stuff. He just did nothing with it. He just played it safe. And God says he's wicked for doing that. That's a strong word to use for people who play it safe by giving God their leftovers. People, if I'm honest, people like me. The Cle- a Clemson fo- a, a, a football program, uh, maybe some from the Clemson football. The uh, their slogan as a college team is two words, all in. Now I, I know you've heard of other companies, organizations that have their tagline maybe as all in, but theirs is all in, and they when they say all in, they mean we are all in. Now this began on October thirteenth, two thousand eight, on a Monday at four p.m. Wow, that's specific, John. Why that exact date and time? Well, on that date was when the head coach of Clemson football, Tommy Bowden, found out that he was being dismissed and let go of the football program. And they walked over to the wide receivers coach, Dabo Sweeney, and they said, you're stepping in as the head coach with a legit opportunity to be the official head coach. And Sweeney then walked over to his staff and his team in the locker room, and he said, quote, the next six weeks are going to be really tough, but I'm all in. I'm all in. And then he said to his staff and players, if you are not all in, don't bother showing up for practice. Everybody showed up for practice. And then they found out it's not just the players and the fans. Everyone is all in. Let me give you a couple examples. When they were about to go into the, into the Orange Bowl a couple years ago, 
the week of going in the Orange Bowl, this is the biggest game of the entire year for their team in college football to get there. That week, Dabo Swinney let go of three players on the team because they weren't all in. Three players who've been in the whole season all the way to the final, and that week he said, you guys are done. You're fired because you're not all in. And so he let three guys go. The fans, uh, some of the fans said, on a Wednesday morning, this man and his family stood on the Sulphur Springs Road overpass in Greenville, South Carolina, along with 40 other people, where they helped hang a bed sheet with the tagline, all in over the freeway for Clemson football when they were driving to it. The same scene was repeated on I-85 at every bridge in between the university and their 50-mile stretch. Every bridge, they had a huge bed sheet that said, Clemson football all in. All those people, they were all in on that. Uh, one of the players said, it's crazy, these fans. He said, it's like all the time around here, uh, the, one, one of the defensive players said, I remember years we played against NC State, and we got home at 3 o'clock in the morning, and there were a couple hundred people waiting, cheering, and singing out in the parking lot for us when we got back at 3 a.m. He said, I was like, so this is how it's at at Clemson. What are they going to be like if we ever win a national championship? These people are going to lose their minds. If those are followers of Clemson football, what about followers of Jesus? If that's what all in looks like for a football team, how about for the king of this world? That should give us a good picture of all in. And here's what I want to say, and, and if I could distill it down to this simple statement, this is it. Jesus is either worth everything or worth nothing, but he's never just worth something. Jesus is worth everything or he's worth nothing, but he's never just worth something. I know we're getting a little bit here, but I, I want to run through this very quickly. Um, uh, Francis Chan, if you know who he is, he's an author, speaker, he's a pastor. He wrote a book called Crazy Love. Anyone read that book before or heard that book, uh, Crazy Love? See a couple hands? Yeah. Um, in that book, he lines out the top eight signs of being a, a, a lukewarm Christian. He uses the lukewarm from Revelation chapter 3. I, I'm going to use the leftover Christian. So what I'm going to do is I want to give you the eight signs in his book of being a leftover Christian. Okay, and I want to just, I want to preface it with this, okay, because these are going to be hard to hear. I'm going to warn you again. These are going to be tough to hear. All right, but I want to warn you, and I just want to say this. God doesn't give us hard words to condemn us but convict us. You hear that? God doesn't give hard words to condemn us, but to convict us. What Satan wants to do is condemn us. Satan wants to bring a hard word into your life so you're filled with shame and you separate from God. God gives you hard words to convict us so we might draw closer to him. So don't hear these words and feel like condemnation. That's Satan. I pray our hearts would be open so I could experience conviction if it's in my life. And I would take an honest self-assessment of my soul and say, is any of these true of me? And if so, God, help me. By your Holy Spirit, help me to follow you more, okay? Here's the first one. Leftover Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They only want to be saved from the penalty of their sin. I just don't want the consequences of my sin. I'm not bothered by the actual sin. That says uh, God is a useful fire escape, not a God to worship. Number two, leftover Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they don't do radical things themselves. Great stories about other people living for God. I love talking about those, but I don't have any of those for my own self. Number three, leftover Christians equate their partially sanitized lives with holiness, but Jesus didn't call us to sanitation. He called us to discipleship. He says, if you are a follower of Jesus, your life will not be defined only by avoiding sin, but also entering into suffering with Jesus. I want to be moral, but don't want to be totally clean. I want to have some parts of my life where they're mine. Number four, 
Leftover Christians rarely share their faith with their neighbors, coworkers, or friends. It nearly and never gets or rarely gets beyond me. Number five, leftover Christians think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. My thoughts are focused on this life. I really think about a life with God beyond this. Number six, leftover Christians love their luxuries and rarely give to the poor in a truly sacrificial way. Number seven, leftover Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. Uh, David Platt says, quote, if you're not in a place where you feel desperate need for the spirit of God, then there's no way you're on the front lines of the mission. When we are on the front lines, we feel desperately our need for God's help. And number eight, kind of what we've been saying, leftover Christians give God their leftovers, not their best and their first. Francis Chan says, quote, stop calling your complacency and apathy a busy schedule. Those are hard words, aren't they? Again, not to condemn, but to convict. And I am right here with all of us. This is not a message for you and not me. This is a message. I've preached this to myself the whole week. I have anybody need to hear this. I've been deeply convicted, to be honest, about my prayer life and just the ways that in the evening sometimes it's like I just lay down and go to bed and don't even give God anything. Don't even take him in to pray. Don't even take him in to acknowledge God in my day. There's many parts of my life I know that are leftovers to you. So this is to me too. But I want to ask, when you became a follower of Jesus, when you said, Jesus, I'm in, did I stay in the crowd or did I become a follower? Did I stay in the crowd or did I say, Jesus, I'm all in? There's parts of me, Lord God, I know right now that are not all in, but I want to be all in. And I want your help to do that, God. Would you help me by your spirit do that? Here's the question I want to leave with you today. What will it take in my life to stop giving God the leftovers? What will it take in my life this week to stop giving God the leftovers? And will I do it? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I know this is a hard word to hear. You gave the Israelites hard words, Lord God, as they were bringing to you just these blemished animals, Lord. It was leftovers. It was the scraps. It was not a care, Lord God. And we are here, Father, and Lord, I, I just think the fact that you came and saved the people like us. You came and redeemed us. You cleaned us up, Lord God. And Lord God, forgive us for the ways right now that we put you behind us. We put you second. Maybe we put you tenth. But God, this morning, we want to be a church and a people who takes you seriously. God, would you bring conviction to our hearts this week as we begin to think about what that looks like? God, what's the area where you're drawing our eyes to? We need to say, okay, God, I can't do this anymore. I need to give this over to you, Lord God, and by your spirit, would you help me? Thank you, God, for loving us and caring for us even when we give you leftovers. In your name, Jesus, amen. Let's continue worshiping together. turned into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you none like you into the darkness you shine out of the ashes we rise there's no
know why we give our, our best to God? Because he gave his best for us, right? God gave the very best. God says, what else could I do for you? I gave you my son. I gave you myself. And not just gave him as an example, but he died on a cross for you. God gave us his very best. It only makes sense we would give him our best. Amen? I pray this week that you pray, allow God to kind of work in your heart, uh, maybe unsettle some things. God, what is it when I'm giving you leftovers? And you confess that and say, help me, God, give you all. I want to be all in. Amen. I pray he does that for you this week. God bless. Have a great, amazing day.